Uh, today I will talk about self-gravitating bosonic and axionic systems and a minimal model for pulsar glitches. This does fall under the title of this meeting, except it's not in two dimensions, it'll be in three dimensions. But anyway, I think it is of relevance. Uh, all the work has been done over several years by Vishwanath Shukla first, who's now at IIT in Kharagpur, uh, Akhilesh Verma, who's in Miami, Sanjay Shukla, who's in the audience, who can answer all the questions, and Marketi and Brashe at the Ecole Normale in Paris. Uh, here is an outline of my talk, motivation, then a quick introduction to uh, the equations that we will use, and some results and conclusions. Uh, what happened? Ah, sorry. I begin with, oops, uh, with some history. Uh, there is a dark matter connection, and perhaps all of you know more about dark matter than I do. Uh, but it goes back very far. It goes back to Kelvin, who suggested dark bodies in Matier Obscure in Poincaré. Uh, but really, it started in the modern form by Zwicky, who used the virial serum to infer the existence of unseen dark matter, which he called Dunkel Materi. Uh, then uh, there's the celebrated measurements by Rubin and Ford, uh, so-called galactic rotation curves, which uh, if you look at the measured rotation speeds in the outside of the galaxy is a function of the distance from the center, then there is a missing mass, roughly speaking, and then this dot dashed line tells you the missing mass, and that is the macroscopic evidence for dark matter. But what is dark matter? That issue is not settled. You can read lots and lots of papers, lots and lots of experiments who try to identify the nature of dark matter. And, uh, but you see, even in very recent meetings, there is a statement, no new smoking gun for dark matter yet. Uh, what are the front contenders? In the old days, people talked of baryonic dark matter. They like nice acronyms, so massive astrophysical compact halo objects called machos. This didn't quite work. Then people went to weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. These are the favorite candidates. But even that, uh, you know, uh, according to a not so learned journal, uh, the WIMP miracle hope for dark matter is dead. We still don't know. I mean, it's not that people, uh, you know, they're, they're doing very careful experiments and still we don't know the answer. There is yet another answer which I will not cover, which is called modified Newtonian dynamics. They say you don't have to think of missing mass, you just modify Newton's laws. Okay, they have, you know, built up a big case, but I think the general consensus is against them. So uh, there are other objects called axions which emerge from a solution to the strong CP problem, which I will not cover. It has to do with the breaking of a global U1 symmetry and the Nambu Goldstone mode associated with that is called an axion. This is also a dark matter candidate. So while all the experts on dark matter try to sort out the exact nature of dark matter, it is in our interest to study different candidates and two such candidates is what we will look at today. One are self-gravitating bosonic systems and self-gravitating axionic systems. Uh, this is also of relevance to statistical mechanics because you have long range interactions. And as we will see, it will also lead us to minimal models for pulsars and their glitches, which I will explain as I go along. All right, now this is the paper. Oh, Vishwanath is there too. He, he started some of this work in our group. So uh, this is the paper I'm going to cover quickly now. And uh, so we begin with the gross pitaevsky equation first. So you set capital G equal to zero. This is a well-known uh, description of a, you know, a weakly interacting Bose gas. It admits Bose-Einstein condensation, psi is a complex wave function. 
but because we want to look at collapsed objects, we now include gravity. So G is gravity, phi is the gravitational potential, which must satisfy this Poisson equation. So this we will call the gross pitayevsky poisson equation. So given this equation, what are we going to do? Little g is the interaction strength between the bosons, weakly interacting, so it's related to the S-wave scattering length. In the absence of gravity, there are, it's a compressible, and you have a speed of sound, and you have a coherence length, which gives you the, uh, you know, the core size of the vortex. Given the time, please don't look at all the details. If you have detailed questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I'll go quickly over the equations just to give you the big picture. All right. So we know how to solve these thanks to Vishwanath starting it all off in this paper with Marc Brache. Uh, you know, we can do a pseudospectral simulation. It's a Fourier truncated system because you keep a finite number of Fourier modes. And the moment you do that, uh, whenever you have a spectrally truncated system, uh, you will get thermalization eventually of this system because it's a finite number of modes evolving, if you like, via the microcanonical uh, method. And uh, so the spectral truncation eventually generates a classical field model which has finite temperature effects in it. Uh, so long as we are still in the region where you have spectral you know, re resolution. So given that, we will be able also to study these systems at finite temperature. I will show you as we go along. If you want details, say for example, in the two-dimensional case without gravity. So this was work done by Vishwanath who's in the audience. And uh, all I want to say is that when you follow the evolution of the gross pitayevsky equation, for example, here in two dimensions, you, initial, you get some initial transients. Then you have onset of thermalization, energy and occupation number spectra begin to show power law scaling. Then you get partial thermalization, spectra show clear power laws with exponents that are independent of the initial conditions. And eventually you get complete thermalization uh, for example, in particular, we were able to extract from such a simulation the full Berezinsky cost split Stavlis transition. Okay, we don't want to go to complete thermalization, but still we will have a temperature and I will show you how we can go along. So now let's go back to gross pitayevsky equation, but with gravity. So gross pitayevsky poisson if you linearize about the constant solution, you will get a dispersion relation of the following sort, which displays a low K, low wave number instability below this genes wave number. Okay, this is a standard genes instability, but now in, in the gross pitayevsky context. Again, here we can do what I just said quickly for the case of the gross pitayevsky equation because we have Galerkin truncated, we can study this, you know, uh, this PG is the, is the projection operator in Fourier space. And uh, various things are conserved, the total number of particles, the total energy, if you do de-aliasing properly, the total momentum, and the energy has three parts. Uh, one is the quantum energy, and this is the interaction energy because of the bosons, the little g, and this is the gravitational part. Okay. Now, uh, if, because we know statistical mechanics, if you are only interested in the final state which you will reach after you run it long enough, you can get there in a faster way by looking at an imaginary time evolution so instead of using a gross pitayevsky poisson equation, you use a stochastic Ginzburg-Landau Poisson equation, which is the same except now the IHI is gone and we have an additional noise and we have a chemical potential. 
So the noise and the chemical potential are such that you have a finite temperature in the end, and uh, you have the required density of bosons that you want. So these are all technical things, which I'm happy to discuss in the breaks, but just, it's just to tell you how we set up the calculation. And then you can study gravitational collapse, all right? So, uh, right, so you start with some initial wave function, which has a uniform density and very small perturbations. And then uh, you can do semi-analytical estimates in certain limits. That is, uh, you take the so-called Thomas Fermi limit, that is the vanishing quantum energy correction. You make some spherical ansatz for the collapsed object. And this has been done in a series of papers by this group. And that gives you certain, uh, you know, length scales and energy scales with which you can non-dimensionalize the final configurations that you find from a full numerical simulation, All right? So here is a, an estimate of the energy for a collapsed object with radius r, and you can take, you can get a length out of it at the minimum value in some limit and so on. So I won't go over all those in detail. Suffice it to say that we will have several ways of non-dimensionalizing lengths and energy scales, but in the simulation, the easiest thing to keep track of is the radius of gyration of the collapsed object where you just take a density distribution rho r, which is just related to the uh, wave function psi, and then you just do that integral to take the square root, all right? Okay, so these are the non-dimensionalizations which I'm not covering because of lack of time. So we do several, several, several runs over several generations of wonderful students. Uh, and let me now just show you uh, what sorts of things we get. So if you just do gross Pitaevsky, sorry? Oh, no. So that was the collapse, this by periodic boundary conditions is a sphere. So this initial configuration collapsed onto a sphere. Okay, this is gross pitaevsky equation at zero temperature. Well, stochastic Ginsburg-Landau. So if you look at the radius, eventually it collapses and you have a given radius for the object, which you can find. So, so no approximation, nothing, just the equations uh, and so on. Okay, uh, you can do more. I mean, I will not show you every movie. This is for some uh, set of parameters for which there are fluctuations. So if you ask for the equivalent temperature, there is a finite temperature. And you can see that if you do the gross Pitaevsky, it doesn't go as cleanly to the final state as does uh, stochastic Ginsburg-Landau. It oscillates a bit, but eventually you can see that it gives you the same answer. So here is stochastic Ginsburg-Landau at the same sort of temperature. And if you want to see a movie to see how it works. So, so and, and this is that with the fluctuations are because of finite temperature. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, it's not working. Ah. All right, and then you can check that the, you know, I, I introduced this stochastic Ginsburg-Landau Poisson equation, and I said that they will give you equivalent results, and this is a, oh God, sorry. Excuse me for this. No. no, where was I? Sorry, it's going the wrong way. As far as I can tell, it's going the wrong way. Uh, 
I really apologize for this. I'm sorry. Okay, I mean, all I was trying to say is that we can check explicitly that the results we get from the stochastic Ginsburg-Lendau Poisson equation and the gross pitayevsky uh, Poisson equation are the same. I mean, it's not a trivial statement insofar as the uh, gravitational interaction is long-ranged. So strictly speaking, there is no thermodynamic limit. So strictly speaking, there is no equivalence of ensembles. Okay? But at a practical level, we find at the level of resolution that we are running these things, that they seem to be equivalent. And the stochastic Ginsburg-Landau Poisson description is advantageous insofar as it helps us to get to the final state of the collapsed object more efficiently than does the gross pitayevsky poisson equation. OK, what is this plot? This shows you that in the absence of gravity, of course, we have a continuous transition, Bose-Einstein condensation. But when we put in gravity, there is a first order transition uh, those of you who are statistical physicists will recognize that here is a hysteresis loop. This is the radius of the collapsed object as a function of the temperature. The red is the so-called heating run. The green is the cooling run. And the fact that I have a hysteresis loop shows you that there is a first order transition. And at uh, low temperatures, we have a collapsed object. And at high temperatures, we have a tenuous Bose gas. Right? OK, is this the only sort of state that we can get? No, it depends on initial conditions. In particular, I can show you a state. You can get a binary star. OK, so you see that you can get a nice binary star. Eventually, it might collapse. It might not collapse. It depends on the initial conditions. All right, so I've shown you how to do uh, a collapsed bosonic star, which is also one of the dark matter candidates. It can also be used by a suitable change of length. The dark matter halo around a galaxy, all right? So, so it depends on which scale you're looking at, and that's a matter of units, which we can discuss in the breaks, if you like. Another dark matter candidate is this axionic star. I told you about axions. And there's this very nice article in the Reviews of Modern Physics. Uh, you know, a collection of axions can condense into a bound Bose-Einstein condensate. For the purposes of this discussion, an axion is different from the bosonic star that I just showed you, because the self-interaction term, which was the coefficient of the quintic term in the gross pitayevsky equation, is negative. So left to itself, it would just collapse. With gravity, it will collapse even more. So to uh, overcome that, you have to introduce another term. So we have to look at a cubic quintic uh, uh, gross pitayevsky system, which is uh, described in this paper in the archive, which has just been accepted for publication in Physical Review D. So now you know the strategy that we will use. So it's again gross pitayevsky poisson but with a quintic term. The quintic term is positive, so that prevents the catastrophic collapse, which would have occurred if little g were negative, which is the case for axions. So. Uh, all right, here are the conserved quantities as before. And uh, you can linearize and uh, find the speed of sound in the absence of gravity, etc., for this axionic system. And then we do the same thing. We have a Galerkin truncated system. Uh, we will have a stochastic Ginsburg Landau Poisson description also. And with that, we will be able to find a 
collapsed object. Now, we could have done this for bosons too, I didn't discuss it at the moment, but now we will also introduce rotation. So, at the level of the stochastic ginsburg landau poisson problem, at zero temperature, let us say, we add a term capital omega times LZ, where is, that's the Z component of the angular momentum. And if we get a spherical collapsed assembly, if there is rotation, uh, you will see what happens. I will get to that in a minute. But let me first tell you about the different states we find. We find, you start with the disordered state. So this is not at finite temperature, this is zero temperature. This is the radius of the collapsed object versus the strength of the gravitational interaction. Disordered first, and then it goes through a sort of metastable state with sheets. If you look at the astrophysics literature, such sheets have been called Zheldovich pancakes. Then these evolve into cylindrical objects, which are shown here, and eventually everything collapses onto a spherical and now an axionic star, if you are using it for a star level description. All right, you can also see such first order transitions marked by his, excuse me. Right, so, so these hysteresis loops uh, mark the first order transitions. This is thermally driven, and this, these ones are at zero temperature, but driven by the uh, coefficient of the quintic term. Right, so again, we have first order transitions from a collapsed axionic object to a tenuous axionic object. So this is what it looks like, and if you include rotation, you will see, as you might expect, that with sufficient amount of rotation, vortices will thread this collapsed object, okay? It's just the analog of putting on a magnetic field in a superconductor. You get uh, this thing, and you can see how it happens. I don't know why this movie is not working, or probably it is working. Uh, anyway, you, you get the message. As I rotate, the uh, vortices will thread the collapsed superfluid. And you can get a rotating binary system, much as we got in the case of the collapsed bosonic system. And here is a movie which shows you how the two constituents of the binary can either keep on rotating or collapse onto each other and so on. And all this out of the sort of description that I have laid out for you, gross pitevsky poisson and if necessary, the imaginary time version of that. Here's a set on units which I can get to in the question and answer session if anyone's interested. All right. Then a little bit about pulsars and their glitches in the remaining few minutes that I have. Now, in 1969, there were two important papers back to back in Nature, the first by Radhakrishnan in Manchester. I bring up Radhakrishnan because for several years, he was then the director of the Raman Research Institute, which is in Bangalore, and uh, another group from JPL in Caltech at the same time. So what is a pulsar glitch? You probably cannot read everything in this slide, but here is the period of the pulsar, and here is the date of observation, and suddenly it's going up, and then quick dip, and, and so on. So this was called glitches, okay? And here is an article by Manchester the same Manchester who was in the original paper, written in 2017. And you can see that by now, by 2017, there were 520 glitches known in more than 180 pulsars. So with the sort of description that we have developed, can we 
uh, say anything about pulsars at some minimal level. And here is the minimal level. Neutron Cooper pairs, which comprise a major component of the nuclear matter in a pulsar, 95%. All right. So there were suggestions, including from the group of Berloff, that this model, which has superfluidity, can be used. They had a 2D Gross Pitaevsky. Other people might have done 3D Gross Pitaevsky, but always with some pinning potential and a quadratic confining potential. All right. Now, what we have done is that, look, gravitational effects must be important. So we must have gravity. <coughs> so at the simplest level, we take gross pitaevsky poisson for a self-gravitating superfluid. We include rotation, as I showed you in the previous few slides. Furthermore, we include an interacting solid crust. If you look at the old paper by Bain, Pethick, and Pines, 69-ish or something, or 70, they also said it could be between you know, these glitches could arise because of the interaction of the vortices with this crust potential. So here is a paper that came out recently, Akilesh, myself, and Mark. And uh, let me first tell you the results. <clears throat> In the absence of the crust potential, we show that if we rotate such a bosonic star, it is threaded by vortices. I've shown you that already in the axionic context. The interaction of these vortices with the crust potential yields a stick-slip dynamics. It leads to dynamical glitches. If enough angular momentum is transferred to the crust from the bosonic star, then the vortices are expelled from the star and the crust angular momentum exhibits features that can be interpreted as glitches. And if you keep track of the statistics of these glitches, you get signatures of self-organized criticality, which have been seen in measurements, uh, astrophysical measurements. So here's the model, one which you know well by now, Rospitevsky Poisson, but with an additional V sub theta which is the crust potential, which I will tell you about in the next few slides. So the crust potential is the simplest model you could think of as a crust. It's characterized just by one angular variable theta. So that's IC theta double dot, IC is the moment of inertia. That's the crust potential and that's a friction term. Okay, so there's some friction. And this potential is such that it is concentrated around some radius, uh, which is R crust. And then there is some angular dependence on these variables, which is taken to be periodic. Don't look at all the details in such a short talk, but I'll be happy to discuss them with you later. If you put all this in, and now you know how we do these things with this Fourier truncated gross pitaevsky poisson various conserved quantities, including the potential if there is no friction, etc. And again, spectral truncation will generate a finite temperature effects. So if you like, uh, you know, we will be taking a functional derivative of this object where the rotation is coming in through the omega jz term and various Lagrange parameters are chosen to conserve those quantities. So here's a plot of the angular momentum versus time. There's a slight decay. That slight decay is because, you know, we have a cubic lattice underlying, so we don't have full rotational invariance. We mimic it pretty, pretty well, but there'll be a slight decay. That has to do. And then as you increase omega, you will see hysteresis loops. So that's forward, that's backward. These hysteresis loops have to do with sudden threading of the object with vortices. And then if you remove the rotation, then you get rid of that. This is what these uh, uh, vortices look like, threading the collapsed assembly. And if you just look at the vortical parts, there are these straight needle-like things going through the collapsed object. Now here is, a picture at successive some different times 
the blue is the crust potential and the red are the vortices and as it rotates sometimes the vortices get kicked out and so on and this is what leads to the glitches all right so if i show you a quantitative plot so please look at this one this is normalized crust potential versus non-dimensionalized time is very, very spiky. If you blow it up, you get these objects, all right? And with such a time series, you're ready to do statistical analysis in the way it is done in the astrophysics literature. From the time series of this crust potential, uh, you know, we can identify the stick slip events if the gain is delta JC, we call delta JC the event size, event duration is T sub ED, and the waiting time to the next event is uh, this waiting time. So these, of course, fluctuate. So you characterize them by probability distribution functions. Here I'm showing you cumulative probability distribution functions. So uh, this event size, clearly has a power law region. The uh, event duration also has a power law distribution. And this one is semi-log. So the, uh, it's a, the waiting time distribution is an exponential. And all these are qualitatively consistent with what is observed in several pulsars. And even the exponents, don't look at the details, to make a long story short, at least in this pulsar, the exponents that we get are in, in, the, in the range, you know, it's, it's roughly the same uh, as what is seen in these pulsars with a really what I would call a minimal model. Okay. Right. So in, in, in just one minute, I will say, uh, you know, I gave this talk in front of astrophysicists once and they said, where's your magnetic field? A pulsar has a huge magnetic field. Well, we can put it in, then you have to put in the protons, which is what Sanjay has been doing. So in addition to the neutron superfluid, which is a gross Pirevsky superfluid, you have protons, which are described by this uh, complicated Ginzburg-Landau thing. There's also Maxwell, so we shouldn't forget Maxwell. There is interaction between neutrons and protons. And eventually you get everything, but after a lot of work, which only Sanjay is capable of doing. And so uh, we get all the essential things right, which I won't worry you with, but I will just end by thanking you and showing you one of Sanjay's movies. The blue are the vortices, the red are the proton flux tubes. Thank you very much. Yes, right. A bit, more about it. bit more meaning, look, I mean, this is exactly what you would do in critical phenomena, for example, if you go back in time. When you have to describe a tricritical point that occurs within a landau ginzburg theory, when the, at the level of the variational free energy, the coefficient of the quartic term also becomes negative. Then you put in the sixth order term. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're putting in the sixth order term, which at the level of the equations of motion becomes a quintic term. I mean, it's in the spirit of the expansion. Yes, right. I mean, you can ask, can we get them from astrophysics? Is our modeling good enough to do? I think the answer is no. But we can get ballpark things right. Yes. Uh, Professor Rahul, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I have a two, um, sorry, I have one question. Um, in somewhere you were mentioning about the first order and second order phase transition, right? Yes. And in the second order, you will lead to a, a Bose density condensation. 
Okay, so normally we know, uh, for example, if you consider kibble zurich mechanism, okay, if you drive across a second order phase transfer, we, we may see uh, defects, okay, like vortices or, or kinks, you know. And then do you see uh, some such things? Well, we uh, never did kibble zurich because, I don't know, but Vishwanath knows all the answers. Kibble zurich was seen in these systems around the time that he was doing his PhD or a little before, right? So yes, answer is short. You see it if you look for it. If there are no further questions, let's thank Rahul and.